research. So um, my name is, is Mark Panisi. I'm a research officer, a cancer researcher in Sydney. And, um, and I'm part of the Genomic Cancer Medicine Group, headed by Professor David Thomas. And the, the focus of our group is, is really on all of the things that you've heard so far this morning, the application of new knowledge about cancer directly to treatment. And although we live in the research space, we are definitely focused on translation and on moving some of the things that we do to the clinic as soon as we can. So uh, my first bit of the talk is going to be introducing some of the technologies and, and just, a, just a tiny taste of some of the things that we are doing in the research space. But then at the end, I'll be discussing a couple of trials that we have underway just now to try to move that into practice. So I've got to apologize to start with. Uh, I'm a bioinformatician and a biostatistician, not professions traditionally known for their ability to give accessible talks. <laughs> but I will do my best. And I thought that what I would do for this is to, um, is to bring everything back to a case that I worked on last year. And this, this shows a lot of the, the features of, of what we're doing um, and the technology that we can bring to bear on the problem, but it also shows some of the limitations that are still present and, and I think highlights where we need to go next also. Oop, could I get the next slide, please? Um, so I'll be talking about a, a case of a, of a young boy called um, Matthew uh, for this talk, not his real name. Uh, he, he was about 10 years old when he was uh, complained of a persistent mild headache. And some um, scans shortly after found that there was very sadly a large tumor inside of his brain. So uh, very, very quickly everything you know, happened at once and um, that, was, that was resected and unfortunately found to be a, a high grade, uh, grade four glioblastoma-like and morphology cancer. So he was given radiotherapy and temozolomide but regardless, the, the cancer still spread and appeared elsewhere in his brain. So um, following that, there was, there was more surgery done. And because it was clear that the radio and the chemo was not enough, uh, at this point, the, the quite extreme measure was taken of um, full brain and spine radiotherapy. Uh, but that didn't work either. And, and it was actually at this point that um, we became involved at the Garvin Institute because there was no other guidance for this case, for Matthew's case. And so the, the question was, well, what, what do we do now? And the hope was in, in a research sense that perhaps we could have a look inside his cancer and try to suggest the next step. And the, bringing, bringing it all back to, to why this is so, this is, uh, this is actually some US guidelines for glioblastoma, but the Australian ones are similar in principle, and that is that oncology is, is based on, it, it's not just people randomly, the oncologists randomly coming up with what they think is the best therapy, it's, it's based on a lot of evidence and a lot of guidelines guiding patients through the best treatment for them based on their disease and how it's progressed. And this is very hard-won information based on dozens of trials, thousands of patients. But the point that I'd like to make is that sometimes it's not complete and a patient will get past second, third, maybe even fourth line and then there's no more guidance to be had. And this happens occasionally in common cancers, but it happens very, very often in rare cancers because we simply don't have the kind of research that we need to build these evidence-based guidelines. And so the, the case, you know, the, in, in Matthew's case, this, this was certainly what was going on, and, and we thought that perhaps we could offer some guidance at the end. And later I'll talk about a way that I think that this, as a, as a researcher, I'm sure that um, Professor Goldstein would, would have um, umbrage with me suggesting too strongly that we could change this, but I think that there's a way that genomic guidance can be fitted into this, into this um, system. And the reason for that excitement, if we could go to the next slide, is, is this slide, which, um, we haven't seen this one before, but we've seen many like it. And this is actually some data out of Melbourne, out of the Peter Mac. And this is showing what can happen when a treatment is targeted precisely to a cancer. And this is a case of metastatic melanoma. On the left-hand side, a PET scan showing there's FDG avid uh, lesions or growths all through. Oh, excuse me. Can we go back one slide? It worked that time. <laughs> all through the cancer. 
And this is before, and this is two weeks after treatment with a drug that targets that exact mutation. And the cancer has almost exclusively shut down. And this kind of res remarkable response is what drives all the excitement about this targeting. Unfortunately, in this case, this is only half the story, and I, I, won't, go on, I won't go on to that anymore. But it does show that this kind of approach can be quite valid. So in Matthew's case, we were very fortunate because we had, at the Garvin, just started up something that, that is the first of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere and a truly exceptional resource, and that is the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics. And this, this is made possible through a lot of very generous founding uh, funds, for, uh, totaling about $50 million from a variety of donors. And that let us set up this center, which provides whole genome sequencing for human health which involved purchasing one of these, the Illumina HiSeq X10, the, the most advanced sequencing system that is available today. And I, I believe that this is still the only one of these in the Southern Hemisphere. And what this let us do was look in completely unprecedented depth into Matthew's cancer to try to find how it has evolved from him, to try to find what is different about his cancer and how it works, and to try to figure out how we can throw a spoke in the wheels and stop it. Now, Joanna mentioned big data, and we've heard it before. Big data is a little bit of a, uh, a swear word for bioinformaticians because we've heard it too much. But it does hold an element of truth. And, and that is that it is a truly large amount of data that, with which we have to deal. And I was struggling with how to explain this. But uh, I thought about this. This is the, I think, the, about the 80s era boxed Encyclopedia Britannica. I, I leafed through one of these quite a lot when I was a kid at home. If you add all that up, that's about 300 million characters. That's not even a tiny bit of what we're looking at. In fact, if you had 15 of them and added all that up, that's not even what we're getting out of these machines when we analyze a person's cancer. That's about one chromosome's worth. So if we multiply that by about 20 to get the full complement, then that is how much data we get out of a normal 30x human genome to try to look for someone with inherited genetic conditions. But cancer's harder than that, and we need to go deeper, about five times deeper. So it, it's a little hard to see, but I, I believe that there's, what, what was it, about 900 or 15, 1,500, I think it was, boxed Encyclopedia Britannica sets there. And that is a lot. It's quite amazing to think that. The, the thing that's actually even more amazing is that this isn't even hard anymore. This is about a week's worth on our sequences, that we can turn this, this kind of data around. Two days later on the computers, we will have the, what makes the cancer different from the rest of Matthew. And it's quite incredible if you think about it, because the machines don't just output this as one nice big string. They shred it up and give you a sentence at a time, and then pile it onto the computers and say, put it back together. And they do it with a remarkable fidelity. So that's actually the easy bit. But going back to, to what we were doing with, with Matthew, we did this. We, we did that much sequencing, and we analyzed it. And we got down to the variants, the way in which his cancer changed from his normal DNA to become something malignant. And we asked the question, is there anything like this that we can find for him? And this is where it gets hard. And this is exactly why I'm glad that I'm talking after Joanna. Because all that I told you is easy. We just give it to computers. They will solve the problem. What comes next? Taking all the lists of variants of someone's cancer, seeing how it's different, seeing trying to figure out how that cancer works, trying to figure out how we can stop it. That's hard. That is human and slow and difficult and intuitive and probably quite flawed. And this is an example of, and we've seen a few of these now from some people, of a very high-level overview of pathways in cancer, very high level. And so it involved two days of us looking through all the variants that we found in Matthew's cancer, reading literature, looking deeper, looking again to try to find something that might work for him. And in the end, we did find something. But it wasn't even on here. It was on one of the sub-pathways, hiding away. And it was this. It was the, what we call the mTOR pathway. And in, specifically, this gene here, TSC1, was mutated in his cancer, but not in his, not in his normal cells, because that's uh, actually a separate condition. And I won't get into the biology here, but. The mTOR pathway is a very, very important pathway in the cell, and when it's activated, the cell gets ready to, to grow, to divide, and it becomes more resistant to dying. 
all things a cancer needs. And so we, we reasoned that if we could restore activity in a way of, M, of TSC1 by inhibiting this pathway, and there are drugs to do so, then maybe we could slow it down, we could have an effect. And it wasn't the best of targets, unfortunately, uh, but it was the very best that we had in this case. And so we, we did a bit of reading around and we found that there was a fair bit of evidence actually that, that supported our idea that maybe this was something that was worth trying. Some evidence suggesting that TSC1 loss, which is exactly what we saw in Matthew's cancer, was a response, uh, was a marker of response to certain classes of drugs. And so we, uh, this was a research project, but it was done with the intent of returning results, and we, we got all that through on ethics. And so we did return the results to our collaborator who referred the case, who then passed it on to Matthew's treating doctor. Of We thought that the best approach was to target mTOR and probably using, we suggested temsorolimus as a potential drug. Now I'm just going to pause here and mention that from the time that we received word of Matthew's case to the time that we sent back a provisional result was 10 days. And that was last year, about August last year. Uh, yes, July. It's only faster and easier now and cheaper too. So this is certainly something that we can do now in research. And it is not that hard to start to translate this to the clinic. So what happened? Well, by this case, as you probably appreciate, Matthew was very unwell. Um, but his, his oncologist um, decided that mTOR inhibition was worth a try. And his, his family thought it was worth a go as well. And so he was given a related drug, not the same one, but a very close one, sirolimus or rapamycin. And, um, and he achieved, well, we, it filtered back to us that he achieved a, a partial response, but it, it merely slowed the cancer down. He did get some improved quality of life for a couple of weeks uh, and, and was out and about, but eventually it did still progress. And so as a next step, he was then given Keytruda, which is one of the new um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that was not effective for him. And actually, when we looked at his genome, we, we determined that almost certainly it would not respond to Keytruda. And, and very sadly, uh, just a few days after that, he passed away uh, almost exactly a year ago. So why am I telling you this? Because that's, you know, it, it, this is a story that affected us very much. And, um, and although we've worked on a few of these, we were really gunning for, for Matthew in this case. Well, the reason I say it is that that isn't quite the end of the story. Uh, after, after all this happened, we moved on. We, we did some other work. Uh, but word came back to us, actually, that to our surprise, we weren't the only group that was working on Matthew's case. There was another group that was also researching him and trying to help. And this group was not using genomics. They were using something called avatars. And avatars are mice into which uh, a patient's tumor, once it's cut out, is implanted many, many, into many mice. And it grows slowly to form a little, little lump. And then those mice can be given drugs to test out the drugs. And whatever works in the mouse, we think works in the person. And avatars are tremendously powerful like that. They're a real test of response. But the problem is that they're, they're very technically challenging. And they're, they're often very slow to set up, too late to help in, in a lot of cases. And that was the case for Matthew. But it turns out that avatars were generated for him. And they were given a lot of drugs. And the drug that worked was temsorolimus. And it worked. and the cancer in the mice disappeared. So this was definitely a, a very uh, bittersweet finding for us because although it, it does validate the approach that we took, it clearly didn't work in Matthew's case. And you know, we, we, we will never know exactly why this is so. But if I had to come up with my biggest reason why, it is that from the time Matthew's cancer was diagnosed to the time that we actually heard about it and started work on it, Although it only took us 10 days to turn it around, it was almost four months. So that's four months in which the cancer is developing, is becoming more aggressive, more mutated. Every time it gets hit with radiotherapy, it becomes more and more hard to control. And at the same time, Matthew's getting sicker and sicker. And at some point, I think that if we go to the very end of the line and try to and expect a miracle, then that may be a little bit too much to ask. So it's my honest belief that the value of these kind of interventions is when they're applied early, not at the very end, when almost nothing will help. 
And, um, and I think that that's a, that's a theme that will come out in, in the years to come. But obviously, you know, that, that flowchart that I showed you and the whole practice of oncology is, is not arbitrary. That's founded on a lot of evidence, and that is best practice. And so we have to think about how to integrate these two things. And so in my last few minutes, I'll be talking about a couple of trials that, my, that our group has underway right now to try to move this into practice, to demonstrate that this kind of approach can work when it's given early enough, and to build capacity to do this here in Australia. And those two projects are the Lions Kids Cancer Genome Project and the MOST study. So the Lions Kids Cancer Genome Project, I'll just briefly talk on, although I don't have much involvement in it myself. It is um, the consequence of a very generous donation from Lions Club International and the Australian Lions Childhood Cancer Research Foundation. And its aim is to provide personalized treatment for children with high need cancer. We are talking just like Matthew's case. $4 million was given for whole genome sequencing and analysis of cancer for 400 children over three years. Now this is currently just starting um, at the Kids Cancer, Center, Kids Cancer Center in Randwick being administered through the Children's Cancer Institute. Uh, but there is a national rollout planned commencing next year. And so if you have any more interest in this trial, please um, do check out that site. But that, this is still a little bit down the road. This is whole genome sequencing, which is very, very hard to do, still quite expensive, still complex. And it's the future, I believe, but it's not quite now. So in terms of what is now, we're, we're, uh, David Thomas has conceived of the Molecular Screening and Therapeutics Program, which is really his, his view on how personalized treatment is actually going to look in three to five years' time in the clinic in use. And this has a very similar aim to provide access to molecular screening and novel therapies for people with unmet clinical need. So we are talking rare cancers here. And this is targeted sequencing, not whole genome and other molecular assays. But this time, because it's targeted, it's cheaper and we can do 1,000 patients. The study is currently open at St. Vincent's Hospital through the Kinghorn Cancer Center. And next year, we'll be opening up in LifeHouse as well. And if you have any questions at all, I'm going to briefly talk about this study a little more. But please find. Dominique Kess, who is here today as well, and she is the um, administrator of this program and will be able to tell you all about it. So this program's idea is that patients with cancer will be passed through molecular screening tests, and then that will be passed onto a molecular tumor board. And this is exactly where you know, Watson will one day step in to really streamline that process. And based on the results, patients will be put into a variety of sub-studies dependent on their particular cancer and which drug we think will work. And currently, the sub-studies that are open are ones for defects in the reti ret retinoblastoma pathway, uh, defects in homologous recombination, and quite uh, a novel um, part of this, and something that David's very excited about, is immunotherapy. Patients who do not have a clear actionable mutation will be placed into an immunotherapy arm. And there, we will try and retrospectively analyze which ones for, you know, for which patients did that work well, for which not so well, and that hopefully will guide further research into markers for immunotherapy response. So just my closing points are that genome-driven personalized therapy is absolutely ready now. In fact, it was ready a couple of years ago, and it's, it's something that I think is just an implementation problem from now on. But for maximum effect, I honestly believe that it must be applied early on in treatment, that if we apply it at the very end, then we're setting ourselves up to fail because it is just too hard. And we have trials underway to establish this here in Australia and to build capacity. So all that's left is to acknowledge a handful of people involved. To be honest, there is many, many more than this. The Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics alone has about 60 people working in it. But the people who were, who were very, very central to what I described uh, at UNSW and, and Sydney Kids, uh, Kerry McDonald was our academic collaborator and Richard Cohen was the um, oncologist involved, and Lion Kids Cancer, CCIA is, is, a, is a hub for that project, and um, Vanessa Tyrrell is, is running that. And thank you very all. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you.